Hello, everyone. We'll get started here in just another minute. Thanks for your patience and thank you for joining today. Hello all and welcome to our fourth session of the Just Wage Forum 2021. My name is Kelly Reagan and I'm a research associate in Catholic social tradition here um, at the University of Notre Dame Center for Social Concerns. I'm also a budding member of the Higgins Labor Program directed by the beloved Dan Graff. Named for Catholic priest, labor economist and union advocate Monsignor George Higgins, the Higgins Labor Program explores questions about work, the politics of work and the work of social justice, all through the lens of Catholic social teaching, which emphasizes such principles as the dignity of work, the right of everyone, not only to decent work, but also to a voice at the workplace and a commitment to the common good. The Higgins Labor Program is housed at Notre Dame Center for Social Concerns, where students, faculty, and staff collaborate with community partners to fuse the efforts of heart and head in the cause of social inclusion and justice. So many thanks to all of you for joining us today. The Higgins Labor Program's major research project is called the Just Wage Initiative, which probes a foundational question rooted in Catholic social teaching. What makes any given wage just or unjust? The major fruit of that research is our new Just Wage Framework and online tool, which is a resource for professors, policymakers, and practitioners to reflect and dialogue upon just wage questions, and hopefully come away more committed to contributing to a fairer, more inclusive, more sustainable, and indeed a more just economy. Our Just Wage Framework consists of seven interrelated criteria, and over the first half of 21, we're hosting experts drawn from the scholarly and practitioner realms to share their insights, expectations, experiences, and concerns regarding the prospects of a more just economy. Meeting mostly every third Friday with the starting time varying to accommodate the busy schedules and disparate locations of our esteemed panelists, we focus on one of the seven just wage criteria with short presentations by both a scholar or researcher and a practitioner or activist both in the spirit of bridging the academic and advocacy realms in the hopes of starting not only new conversations, but also new initiatives. We kicked off the forum on February 12th, where we introduced the Just Wage Framework and heard a great talk historicizing concepts, conceptions of the living wage from economist Don Stabile. Three weeks ago, we focused on criterion one of the Just Wage Framework. A just wage facilitates a decent life, and we had wonderful presentations by Thea Lee of the Economic Policy Institute on the need to raise the minimum wage and the urgency of restoring workers' collective bargaining power. And Notre Dame love Stephanie Garakanian of the Workers' Defense Program on the campaign for paid sick days in Texas. Just before Easter, we focused on Criterion 2, a just wage enables asset building. And we heard thought-provoking reflections from Clemen Sedmack, professor of social ethics here at the University of Notre Dame, as well as Randy Kinder and Thalia Lankin of the AFL-CIO Investment Trust Corporation in Washington, DC. If you missed any of these sessions or would like to revisit them, you can access the videos from the Just Wage Forum website. Our next session on April 30th at 10 a.m. Eastern is devoted to Criterion 4, a just wage is free from discrimination and fosters inclusion. We'll look forward to presentations by Charlize Hurst, Assistant Professor of Management at the Mendoza College of Business here at the University of Notre Dame, and Mona Lisa, a Notre Dame alumna and business and human rights attorney in India. Connie Mick, the Director of Academic Affairs and of the Poverty Studies Interdisciplinary Minor at the Center for Social Concerns will respond. We'll hope you join us and that you help spread the word. Today, our focus is on criterion three of the just wage framework. A just wage provides social security. As we see it, a just wage, 
as we see it, a just wage includes um, social security benefits for the worker and for the worker's household, which includes adequate health care coverage, retirement income, wage protection in case of injury, inability to work and death, and wage protection in the case of unemployment. It also provides for paid leave upon the birth or adoption of a child, provisions to defray the expenses associated with child care and paid leave upon the extended illness of a household member. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the Criterion as we've put together a series of resource pages organized into the following categories. What does Catholic social teaching say? What does the research sow? And what is the law? And who does it well? In a few crisp paragraphs, each resource page introduces the topic and points the reader to other resources for deeper exploration. Before we turn to the main event, I should say a note about protocol and participation. We will devote about 20 minutes to each presentation from our featured speakers, followed by 15 minutes or so of a conversation between them and a member of our Just Wage working group. We'll then have nearly 30 minutes for discussions of where the speakers um, will answer questions from the attendees. So to that end, we ask that you use the Q&A function that you see on your screen below to raise questions or comments during the presentation and afterward. We'll do our best to prioritize and address as many of these questions as we can. And for those that we don't get to, we can also always follow up outside of the session via email. Thank you again for joining us today and many thanks too for those involved in making the Just Wage Forum possible. Today's first presenter is Andrew Shrink, Professor of Sociology and International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Andrew has consulted for the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the United Nations Development Program. He has also collaborated with Somos Un Pueblo Unido, an immigrant rights organization based in New Mexico, and the Center for a New Economy in San Juan, Puerto Rico. His research interests include migration, training, and the protection of unskilled workers in the United States and Latin America. The organizational and professional basis of pharmaceutical access policies, policies in the developing world and the measurement and consequences of corruption. He recently co-authored a book titled Root Cause Regulation, Protecting Work and Workers in the 21st Century with Michael Pior of MIT. Andrew, Andrew will speak on rethinking wages, employment and social security in light of recent pandemics, political and biological. Andrew, with that, I will turn the floor over to you. I've already botched the Zoom. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone at Notre Dame, and thank you, everyone online. Um, I guess I want to preface my remarks today by saying that a lot of time has passed between uh, Dan first asking me to take part in this event and the event itself. And I'll be honest with you, my thoughts about the question uh, have evolved over that time. I think that evolution has occurred partly in response to the pandemic, uh, which I'm sure I'm not alone. Uh, you know, I've been influenced by that pretty profoundly, um, partly by the election and the aftermath of the election, both the immediate aftermath and the, the attempted coup and the uh, initial Biden policy initiatives. And then I think just the passage of time and that you know we tend to think about these questions almost on a daily basis and, and our views evolve. Um, but just to go back to something Kelly said, I wanna begin with the proposition uh, that uh, a just wage includes, and I'm not gonna quote this word for word, healthcare coverage, retirement income, wage protection in the event of injury, death, uh, et cetera, unemployment, uh, paid leave upon the birth of a child or adoption of a child, uh, child care, family and medical leave uh, uh, for uh, the case of the extended illness of a household member. Basically, a just wage is presumed to include an extensive set of what in the United States we would conventionally term benefits, okay? And I think, my gut reaction when I hear that is to think, yes, that's true. That is in fact what a just wage includes. But as I sat down to really think about this and, and put together this presentation, a number of questions occurred to me and I wanna share them with you and sort of think through some hypotheticals. And uh, the first one, and these are you know, rhetorical, I'm not asking you to, to respond, um, but it's admittedly extreme. Imagine somebody offered you a $10 million a year raise to give up your benefits, assuming your current job does provide benefits. Uh, would you take the deal? Uh, would you consider the new deal just? Uh, would you consider it more or less just than the old deal in which you're paid less but got the extensive set of benefits that you currently get or hopefully you currently get? And why or on what basis would you answer those questions? Okay. Uh, so that's one question. 
A second question, uh, which isn't at all hypothetical, uh, concerns a process I'm going through of hiring a research assistant, an undergraduate research assistant. Uh, and I'm hiring her for 10 hours a week. And I was told that the going rate for an undergraduate RA here at Brown was about $12 an hour. Uh, but since I'm committed to the fight for 15, I posted the job at $15 an hour for you know, a total wage of $150 a week. Uh, in my defense, I can't imagine using the RA for the full 10 hours. So de facto, uh, I'm sure that I'll be paying her more than $15 an hour. But I definitely will not pay enough to cover her health care, her maternity leave, her child care, and the broader array of benefits included in the just wage criteria. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, and in this case, I actually have good reason to believe, that my RA either doesn't need these things or is getting them elsewhere, or doesn't need them because she's getting them elsewhere. Uh, but still, I have to ask myself, am I paying an unjust wage? Uh, and that's not a rhetorical question. It's something I am asking myself. What about teenagers who work part-time and don't receive benefits? Salespeople who work on commission? Uh, independent contractors, are they being paid an unjust wage? Uh, it seems to me there are several possible answers. Uh, one can play linguistic games and just dodge these questions. For instance, you could argue that $10 million a year as a wage does provide social security, de facto, since much of the money that you'd be, uh, with that much money, you'd be set for life. Uh, and you could buy all the security you needed on the private market with IRAs and private health insurance plans and things like that. Uh, but if that's your argument, why have criterion three at all? Why not just assume that criteria that social security defined in this way is already covered by criterion one, which to remind you is that a just wage enables a decent life for the worker and the worker's household. If a just wage demands a decent life for a worker and a worker's household, uh, does it really demand social security on top of that? Or is social security part and parcel of a decent life for the worker and the worker's household? Uh, uh, either providing enough cash to meet the standard needs of a household uh, and the benefits to cover social security or by providing enough cash that the benefits are moved, okay? Uh, or you could argue uh, that teenagers and young adults don't count or that commissions aren't wages or that the self-employed and independent contractors are making profits rather than wages and therefore aren't covered by the just wage criteria. Uh, but at that point, the boundaries begin to feel a little bit blurry to me, perhaps even arbitrary. It's okay to pay a 17 year old an hourly wage without benefits, but the minute he turns 18, you're unjust. Or is the cutoff 21 and not 18 and why? And how do you decide? Uh, are Uber and Lyft more just than Quickie Mart because they hire part-time work workers as independent contractors and pay them by commission, uh, even if their take-home pay is lower than the take-home pay of the salaried worker at the Quickie Mart who doesn't get benefits. And finally, these definitional games give rise to perverse incentives. That is, they encourage employers to abandon the traditional employment relationship for non-traditional ones, creating what economist David Weil calls the Fisher workplace. Uh, so that's one solution to the sort of non-traditional employment relations or non-traditional personnel that I've talked about above. Uh, alternatively, one could argue that these non-standard employment relationships, part-time work, independent contracting, commissions, things like that, are the essence of fishering and should simply be outlawed, leaving nothing but a traditional full-time workforce with an extensive array of benefits. Uh, and in some sense, I have sympathy for this notion. Uh, in fact, I think it's my gut reaction. Uh, but let's not ignore the cost of such a move. Youth employment can constitute an important step on the path to adulthood. Um, you know, with summer coming on, I wish the pandemic ends so my teenagers could get summer jobs. Uh, Part-time work allows adults, including adults with complicated schedules, who are often burdened in other arenas of their lives to reconcile their disparate responsibilities. Some workers actively prefer self-employment, even if I think they're being shafted in the process. Uh, Jonathan Russo had a very interesting piece on this in Talking Points Memo the other day, where he recounted his experience going into a factory as an SDS member in the 1960s in an effort to radicalize the workers only to find out that the workers didn't want to be ra radicalized. What the workers wanted to be was small businessmen, saving to buy their own franchises or going to school nights so they could get their real estate licenses and open a real estate brokerage and things like that. A third possibility in light of non-traditional employment re relationships and non-traditional personnel is that social security should simply be decoupled from the employment relationship, that everybody should get health care, retirement income, child care support, et cetera, regardless of their employment situation or history. 
This might look something like Swedish social democracy. It might look like the Danish system of flex security. And it might seem inconceivable from the US, but it's not quite as inconceivable as it used to be in light of the ongoing evolution of our patchwork safety net. We've long had social security and Medicare protecting the elderly and differently abled, albeit for protecting them imperfectly. Medicaid and Obamacare are expanding. We have public schools, and it now seems greater federal, federal spending on early childhood education, pre-K and the like. And if the Democrats are able to make President Biden's expanded child, tax, uh, child care uh, credit permanent, as is their want, we'll no longer be the only high-income OECD country to lack a family allowance. Finally, the newly released American Jobs Plan includes massive support for the elderly, $400 billion, in fact, which is the biggest single line item in the entire proposal. In fact, I've argued that in addition to a Green New Deal, the Biden administration is de facto pursuing a Gray New Deal, addressing the demographic imbalances created by a growing elderly population that needs costly care and a shrinking younger population of producers and providers by first of all, putting hundreds of billions of dollars into support for the elderly. Second of all, allowing young people to have more children uh, they currently fall short of their ideal fertility by almost one child per couple, according to sur surveys, by underwriting the cost of childcare broadly defined, and by investing in education and training so when the, those kids grow up, they have the skills they need to support the elderly population, both directly and indirectly. Where does this leave us? How does this relate to a just wage and social security? It seems to me that a just wage is not an end in itself, but a means to an end the end of a just society. I may be pushing against the grain on this, but we can have that discussion soon. And if it's really just a means to the end of a just society, it seems to me, that there are at least four paths to getting there and that they're differentiated by their answers to two distinct questions. First, is social security conditioned on employment or on citizenship or residence? And second, should social security be guaranteed directly via services or indirectly through cash payments? And those two questions lead to a table somewhat like this, okay? In my ideal world, the government offers social security as a right of citizenship or perhaps residence. This can be done through direct service provision as in the Northwest quad quadrant of this table, like the National Health Service in the UK or food stamps in the US or finished preschools, et cetera. And or it can be done through cash transfers as in the Northeast Quadrant, like the guarantee pension in Sweden, the Canadian baby bonus and similar family allowances, including Biden's child tax credit. Insofar as some aspects of social security, like retirement income involve cash, this line between services and cash is a bit blurry but this really needn't burden us here. Uh, this would address my RA dilemma and our part-time employment dilemma and other such dilemmas. Frankly, it would be a far more efficient system than the one we have or propose at present. In other words, conditioning benefits, whether cash or services on citizenship or residence and not on employment. But this isn't the world we live in. Even in Sweden, the guarantee pension provides a subsistence minimum of sorts. Uh, and in the U.S., where the patchwork, uh, I'm sorry, a minimum of sorts, and most Swedish retirees have additional retirement income that is, in fact, linked to their employment history. And in the U.S., where the patchwork welfare state is evolving slowly, employment-linked benefits are even more important and moving in the wrong direction for a variety of reasons, not least of all because of the aforementioned fissuring of the employment relationship, contracting out and the like. So I'd be delighted to see employment-linked benefits in the US make a comeback, expanded and solidified enough to provide social security in the Southwest Quadrant. And this would look something like criterion three, or to see wages increased enough to make their failure to do so less important as in the Southeastern Quadrant, where you have compensating wage differentials. You're compensated for your lack of benefits by getting greater cash. That would fall under criterion one. I have a slight preference for the former approach, services over cash, largely on efficiency grounds. The government can use its bulk purchasing power to negotiate better terms than we can as individuals. And I can't gamble away my insurance card the way I can gamble away cash. 
But frankly, I'd be happy with either. My goal is the just society. Whether and to what degree that justice comes from employment versus citizenship or residence, cash versus services is entirely secondary to me. So a key question, therefore, is whether politically to push toward the strengthening of employment-linked benefits or toward bolstering universal citizenship or residence-based benefits. And if you'd asked me this question a year ago, I probably would have said the former, work-related, employment-related benefits on practical as well as ethical grounds. Practical, because the expansion of universal benefits seems so unlikely to me, and ethical, because I think there's something about the dignity of work and linking reward to effort that appeals to most people, including most workers. But I've begun to reconsider this position, in part because the Biden agenda feels not only revolutionary to me, but popular. As Mary Harris just wrote in Slate, it leaves Reaganomics on the ash heap of history, and it makes a vast expansion of the safety net at least thinkable for the first time in generations. But also in part because I increasingly think this dignity of work stuff is troubling, because it suggests that non-wage work isn't dignified or important. That when I take care of my own kids for free, it's not dignified, but when I take care of yours for a wage, it is. Does it imply that those who can't perform work because of limits to their ability lack dignity? Or that volunteer work isn't dignified and so on and so forth? What's wrong with a publicly guaranteed minimum of social security to which individuals can add if they so desire? So with all this in mind, I guess I'd wrap up with three conclusions. First, I think the context and the counterfactual matter enormously. I suspect when most of us hear a proposition like a just wage provides social security, our default counterfactual is an unjust wage doesn't provide social security, or a wage that doesn't provide social security is unjust. But that depends on context, where someone else, like the government guarantees social security, or when wages and salaries are high enough to cover private provision, we might worry less about employment-linked social security benefits in the traditional sense. And in thinking about this, we consider an expanded range of counterfactuals. Not only an unjust wage doesn't provide social security, but the government provides social security and wages do something else. Second, trying to compartmentalize the different aspects of a just wage comes with costs as well as benefits. It feels to me that the just wage scorecard as currently designed assumes that the different dimensions of a just wage are complements rather than substitutes. That is higher pay, at least up to a point goes with better benefits of a just, uh, uh, with better benefits and more voice at work, et cetera. And usually that's the case, but it's not inherently the case. They could be substitutes. When employment-linked benefits first made their appearance in the US, for instance, they were an alternative to pay increases that workers worried would be inflated away. That is a substitute, not a complement. It's also probably naive to assume that minimum wages never kill jobs. Even Michael Reich and Aaron Dubé wouldn't argue that. Or that in at least some contexts, collective bargaining rights don't threaten the wages of the highest paid workers as they nonetheless raise wages on average and flatten the income distribution. We can agree or disagree about the normative implications of all this. We'd be naive and wrongheaded to just ignore these possibilities, especially given their political implications. In a world where there's no alternative source of health insurance, for instance, employment link guarantees make a certain amount of sense. But if there are alternatives like universal citizen or residence-based guarantees, the link to employment may be less important or even counterproductive as it pits the employed who want to protect their benefits against the un or underemployed who have no benefits at all, among other things, just as we saw in the original Obamacare debates. Just as collective bargaining, if carried out myopically, can divide more than unite. And finally, by way of conclusion, enforcement matters. Legally mandated benefits aren't helpful if they just drive employers underground and workers off the books. But in much of the world today, the majority or at least a large minority of the labor force is informal and underground employment is common. It's, it's common in the US as well, if by no means the norm. This is partly due to underinvestment in enforcement and partly due to the disorganization of enforcement. I won't belabor these points, but suffice it to say that the typical US firm will get inspected by a labor or workplace inspector less than once every 50 years. And when it does get inspected, that inspector will look at a single violation, 
health and safety, or wages and hours, or discrimination, despite the fact that in the real world, violations tend to travel in packs. The same employers who violate one law violate all laws. This fissuring of the enforcement model is no less problematic than the fissuring of the employment relationship. It makes absolutely no sense, and it needs to be addressed if we're going to have employment link benefits that actually are followed through upon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, so much for your remarks. I think especially important is your recognition of a just wage as not an end in itself, but as a means to the end of a just society. That was that was really powerful. I think it um, harkens back to the Catholic social teaching passage that characterizes a just wage itself as the key measure of, socio of socioeconomic justice. So thank you for your remarks. Um, our next speaker is Clayton Sinyai, a Executive Director of the Catholic Labor Network, an association of Catholic Union activists and clergy, religious, and laity that are committed to upholding Catholic social teaching in labor and in work. A former rubber worker, railroad, railroad clerk, and letter carrier, he has spent the past two decades in a variety of union staff roles as a researcher, organizer, and communications director. Clayton is a member of the Construction Laborers Union, Lo union Local 11 in Washington, DC, and he has a PhD in political science. He's also the author of Schools of Democracy, a political history of the American labor movement. Clayton will speak on the topic, what does a just wage have to do with social security, a Catholic perspective. Clayton. Thank you. Um, uh, as mentioned, my name is Clayton Sinya. I am the executive director of the Catholic Labor Network. Our organization came together about 25 years ago um, in uh, bringing together a group of Catholic union activists with Catholic clergy, uh, religious and lay social justice advocates who shared a passion for Catholic social teaching around labor and work and a desire to show solidarity with workers uh, in, in the fight for a just wage. Um, let me share my screen now. I've been asked to speak today on the proposition that a just wage provides basic social security for worker and household. And uh, so I will uh, speak and what I'm calling my remarks is what does social security have to do with a just wage? A Catholic answer. A just way, uh, according to uh, the proposition, a just wage includes for the worker and the worker's household, adequate health care coverage, retirement income, wage protection in case of injury, inability to work and death, wage protection in case of unemployment, and provisions for wage for paid leave upon the birth or adoption of a child, provisions to defray the expenses associated with child care and paid family leave upon the extended illness of a household member. Uh, that's the way the just wage tool puts it. At first glance, it doesn't sound like this is an issue of wages at all. After all, many of these things are provided by the government through tax dollars, as our previous speaker mentioned. Why are we talking about it as a matter of just wages? Well, part of the answer may be found in the roots of Catholic social teaching. Um, Catholic social teaching, modern Catholic social teaching at any rate, began with the document Rerum Novarum, uh, translated from the Latin of the new things. Pope Leo XIII, uh, who wrote it, um, had a real subject of writing about the Industrial Revolution, the new things of the Industrial Revolution, and how to predict human dignity in the modern era. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most people were self-employed on family businesses. The vast majority were farmers who worked the land as a family unit to provide for their own subsistence. A smaller but still large number were shopkeepers or tradespeople who ran their own businesses, again, usually as a family team. The big change of the Industrial Revolution wasn't so much technology, big as that was, but a transformation of the majority of the population from independent proprietors to wage workers dependent on, dependent on employers. Now that they were no longer independent, but in a social relation, the church had to consider the rights and obligations of all parties in the transaction, employee, employer, and society. And that called for a look back into the natural law. 
What is natural law? Well, it's a concept drawn from the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers. The idea that there's an order in the universe and that humans must conform themselves to it if justice is to be served. Christians would say that God wrote this order into the design of creation and that we need to evaluate all our individual and social behaviors in light of this natural law. It's not enough to just say whatever wage is set by the labor market, that is whatever the market will bear is a just wage. The wage must conform to the natural law. And the natural law says that a person works to support him or herself and their family. Consequently, a just wage according to the natural law is a living wage, one capable of supporting the worker and his or her family. Leo XIII put it uh, this way explicitly in his encyclical 130 years ago. Let the working man and the employer make free agreements, and in particular, let them agree freely as to the wages. Nevertheless, there underlies a dictate of natural justice more imperious and ancient than any bargain between man and man, namely that wages ought not to be insufficient to support a frugal and well-behaved wage earner. If through necessity or fear of a worse evil, the workmen accept harder conditions because an employer or contractor will afford him no better, he is made the victim of force and injustice. Leo started, uh, Pope Leo started modern Catholic social teaching with three key premises. First, that the wor worker deserved a living wage by right, whether or not the labor market supplied this. Second, that workers had the right to form unions and even strike to pursue this right. And third, that if this was not sufficient, the state had to step in to either legislate living wages or to supply the needs of underpaid workers in some other way. Now over time, as the world developed and subsequent popes and theologians analyzed the natural rights of workers, they built upon this foundation with additional rights. The compendium of the social doctrine of the church, a sort of catechism summarizing the essentials of Catholic social teaching, wrote them out. That is, the rights of workers, like all other rights, are based on the nature of the human person and on his transcendent dignity. The church's social magisterium has seen fit to list some of these rights in the hope that they will be recognized in juridical systems. The right to a just wage, the right to rest, the right to a working environment and to manufacturing processes which are not harmful to the worker's physical health or their moral, or their moral integrity. The right to one's personality in the workplace should be safeguarded without suffering any affront to one's conscience or personal dignity. The right to appropriate subsidies that are necessary for the subsistence of unemployed workers and their families. The right to a pension and to social to insurance for old age, sickness, and in case of work-related accidents. The right to social security connected with maternity. The right to assemble and form associations. These rights are often infringed, and as, as is confirmed by the sad fact of workers who are underpaid without protection or adequate representation. It often happens that work conditions for men, women, and children, especially in the developing countries, are so inhumane that they are an offense to their dignity and compromise their health. Uh, so as you see, I've highlighted in yellow some of the indications uh, for uh, um, Social Security. Um, this goes much further than a living than a just wage, though. Why would that be? Well, let's think back to the natural law. The church calls for social arrangements that affirm and support the natural law. And in the church's perspective, one of the most basic premises of natural law is that every human being has an innate dignity that must be respected. This innate dignity is not limited to those who can work. The person whose injury, illness, or age prevents them from working must not be abandoned. For the same reason that the church forbids abortion and euthanasia, the church insists that no one be left destitute. 
to allow the injured or the sick or the old to suffer hunger and homelessness if they can't work would offend human dignity, at least in today's relatively rich and productive society, which can afford to provide for them. Society is prosperous today and justice itself requires that all share in its fruits. Another element of the natural law in the understanding of the church is the sanctity of the family as one of the three necessary societies of humankind, along with the church and civil society. Uh, that's why Pope John Paul II um, insisted that the means of checking uh, the justice of social arrangements concerns above all the family. Just remuneration for the work of an adult who is responsible for a family means remuneration which will suffice for establishing and properly maintaining a family and for providing security for its future. Social institutions that support the stability of the family are consistent with the natural law, while those that undermine the family oppose the natural law. Now thinking for a moment, what happens if my wife is injured on the job and can't work, or if she falls ill or loses her job? Now she has ceased to bring in an income and has become an expense. This gives me an economic incentive to leave her and seek another partner who can bring in an income. Let's hope I wouldn't do this, but it would certainly be a temptation uh, that we could do without. By providing safe working conditions, workers' compensation and health coverage and unemployment insurance, we support family stability. We structure our institutions to conform to the natural law. These may explain why the natural law protects these rights, but most of the rights above, a safe workplace, unemployment benefits, workers' compensation and disability benefits, health coverage, social security and old age, all of these are either provided or guaranteed by the state. If these are the components of a just wage, why would the state be guaranteeing them instead of, uh, um, instead of the employer? Well, that brings, to us, uh, brings us to another concept from Catholic social doctrine, subsidiarity. 40 years after Rerum Novarum, uh, the uh, encyclical Quadragesimo Anno was released. Written in 1931, as many governments were expanding their role in the economy in response to the depression, he called for an activist government. He did not want the state to run everything. And in fact, most of the time when people speak of subsidiarity, they are stressing the point he made when he wrote, it is an injustice and at the same time a grave evil and disturbance of right to order of right order to assign to a greater and higher association what a lesser and subordinate organizations can do. Uh, but the Holy Father also said that the supreme authority of the state ought, therefore, to let subordinate groups handle matters and concerns of lesser importance, which would otherwise dissipate its efforts greatly. Thereby, the state will more freely, powerfully, and effectively do all those things that it belongs to it alone, because it alone can do them. For most of the social security functions we discussed, it proved impractical for individuals or even individual firms to take responsibility for them. In a competitive market, any company that chose to care for the injured and disabled workers was quickly put out of business by more ruthless competitors. Starting with mandatory workers' compensation insurance in the late 19th century, the various forms of social, insur social insurance and social security were layered on to insure workers against risks that they could not prepare for. Risks such as workplace injury, sudden illness, or even an, un an unexpected long life that ran beyond one's planned retirement savings. This is why in Catholic thought, a just wage includes for the workers, for the worker and the worker's household, adequate health care coverage, retirement income, wage protection in case of injury, inability to work and death, wage protection in case of unemployment, and provisions for paid leave upon the birth of adoption, birth or adoption of a child, 
provisions to defray the expenses associated with childcare, and paid family leave upon the extended illness of a household member. These things, as the previous speaker mentioned, can be provided by the firm or by society as is appropriate, but every worker is due basic social security as a matter of natural right. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton, especially for your detailed um, and rich overview of Catholic social teaching. We will now turn um, to a brief response. Um, our respondent is Emily Marola, um, who will respond to both Andrew and Clayton's recent presentations. Emily is a former student researcher for the Just Wage Initiative um, of the Higgins Labor Program, and she's currently a research associate at Notre Dame's Lab for Economic Opportunities, where she manages impact evaluations for provider partners in the field. Emily, if I could pass the floor over to you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. And, and thank you both for your presentations today. Um, I just have a few quick remarks and thoughts, but I'm really interested in continuing the conversation further and also getting some Q&A started surrounding this topic. So um, with that, without, with that for, without further ado, uh, we'll go into some of those. Um, so I'm excited at the prospect of responding to your all's presentations when it comes to the Just Wage Framework today, in large part because I think that your presentations prompt a lot of interesting questions about something very core to everyday life. So for example, the, the social safety net in the US, for example, and then core questions also about the Just Wage Framework itself and including criterion three within it. Um, something that you all address about the criterion is the context surrounding it and how it seems farther away from the employer-employee relationship than perhaps some of the other criterion that are in the just wage framework. So for example, uh, I think the last criterion, which is about um, adjusting pay to be equal to performance and, and things like this. Um, but sometimes even just seeing the name of this criterion as social security prompts thoughts about seniors receiving checks in the mail under the federal program of the same name, which, which you all point out. Um, and it's also a program that ultimately ties retirement benefits to a person's work. Um, as somebody that's uh, sort of odd and interested in tax policy like myself, um, I might be thinking about uh, the payroll tax that's under the same name as well and how we ultimately tie retirement benefits to a person's work, but channel it through a public provision, which is really interesting rather than an employer. Um, and so, so there's some really interesting discussions that relate to this who provides topic that I hope that we can get to and, and talk about more. Um, Something else that's fascinating about the criterion that you all identify is its scope and its complexity and its importance to everyday life. It's, it's not just about the retirement income or social security in the federal government's definition, but it's also about health benefits, insurance for one's income in the face of unanticipated risks, uh, paid leave for parents or caretakers, and then also defraying expenses for childcare. Um, and in all, Criterion 3 is about subgroups that are diverse, important to everyday life, and not necessarily limited to the employer-employee relationship. And I think the presentations bring up some really interesting conversations about implementation sort of specifically in that sense. And so that is caring not just about whether or not those benefits are accessible or provided to people, but how, by whom, and also for whom. Um, and on this point, it's interesting to think about the surrounding context for some of the benefits under Criterion 3 within the United States specifically. Um, looking closer at some of the areas included in Criterion 3, we can see a landscape of coverage that, um, if provided at all, is often provided as a patchwork, as, as you noted, Andrew, um, that largely depends on who you are. Um, health coverage really provides a, a salient example for that. And even when I was condensing this into a simple rundown as I was reflecting, um, it ends up being really complex. And so uh, you might not have signed up to hear about these different uh, complexities listed today, but I'm trying to make the patchwork point. And so <laughs> here goes. So in terms of health insurance in the US, if you are, it depends on who you are, right? So if you are an adult employed by a company or organization with a health plan, that's your source of coverage. If you're a senior, that coverage comes from Medicare, but perhaps you add additional private coverage on top of that. If you're a person with a low income, you might be eligible for Medicaid, which will vary in eligibility and also coverage details by the state that you live in. Um, if you're a low income child, you have additional coverage from the Children's Health Insurance Program or CHIP. If you're a veteran, that'll come from various federal sources like the VA. If you're a, if you're a person not covered yet who has the money and the time, you could purchase coverage directly and in some cases do that with assistance from the state or from federal government. Um, and so that's a lot of things. Um, and according to the census for 2019, um, or the Census Bureau, um, this patchwork ends up covering most people. 
So around 92% of people in 2019 listed having some sort of health insurance. That leaves around 30 million people that didn't have coverage in that year. And so that's worth noting. But even if everybody was covered under this system and we found sort of a patch to cover that hole, it seems like there's something left to be desired about that system. <laughs> and, and that's what I mean by the implementation point that I think uh, came up in both of your all's presentations. And what I found compelling about your presentations is that it's not just about whether the coverage is provided, but also how. Um, you might have noticed that the numbers I cited from the Census Bureau are from 2019, not 2020. <laughs> and to build on what you all mentioned in your presentations and also continue the conversation, I wanted to add a layer of significance that seems to be brought in by the COVID-19 crisis as well, just to sort of frame the discussion and, and the Q&A going forward. Um, in a lot of ways, the COVID-19 crisis has made subcomponents of Criterion 3 and the patchwork systems that, that may exist for it in the US or not um, a larger part of people's conversations. Um, and part of that is because of how any economic recession impacts people in the US. So decline in economic activity translates into not just the loss of your work for many people, but also the loss of the benefits that could have come with your work. So your income, perhaps your health coverage, perhaps a way to get childcare, whether that was sort of an on-site childcare center, for example, or just simply being able to afford it with your income from the job. Um, and continuing the description from the health insurance example provided earlier, uh, a recession changes a lot of how, who people are or how they're seen in the eyes of, of benefit eligibility and then things like this. Um, and there's also, though, things that are somewhat unique to the COVID-19 crisis that bring Criterion 3 to the forefront. Just one example that I can think of is the strong impact this crisis has had on maternal employment. Um, for example, school closings, gender-based divisions of labor in the household have meant for many mothers cutting back or leaving their employment, especially if they are mothers that have young children, for example. And so um, thinking about sort of gender-based differences when it comes to the provision of these benefits, especially if they're employer-related, um, it has some interesting context with COVID-19. Um, I mentioned these things as a segue for the following broad topics of conversation that seem relevant to this criterion and also to your all's presentations. Um, first, it seems like Criterion 3 in particular prompts a discussion about how somebody comes to have coverage or benefits and why that is important. Um, together, the presentations touch on this with concepts related to who should provide coverage, the means by which coverage is delivered, the feasibility and practicality of any option, and then also the underlying Catholic ideas like human dignity and subsidiarity uh, that should be included in the background behind any of those conversations. Um, and also related to this idea of how is sort of a second topic for discussion, which is thinking about the value of including something like Criterion 3 under the banner of the Just Wage Framework um, and side by side with other criterion that are under the framework as well, um, that seem maybe more so closely tied to the employer-employee relationship. Um, summed up in a question, what does including Criterion 3 imply for the Just Wage Framework and how it's used, how it's understood, how it's talked about? And then finally, um, if we agree that how is important <laughs> to the criterion, um, beyond just providing coverage, it implies that further decisions must be made down the line if we're trying to find the optimal way to go about providing these things. And I think that the conversations around how we evaluate the various alternatives in front of us um, could be extremely interesting to, to hear from you all about. Um, and so summed up in a question for, for that category would be when it comes to the optimal choice of who, what, when, where, why, how do we, how do we approach each? Um, and so with that, I'd really like to start uh, running questions of my own by you all just to, to learn from your perspectives. And then uh, afterwards, I imagine that this could this could flow into incorporating uh, Q&A from the audience as well. Um, but perhaps a place that we could start is um, I was thinking while reflecting on the presentations and Criterion 3 about how some of the biggest proposals in terms of expanding related benefits and, and coverage came in the wake of different crises. So, for example, the Great Depression and New Deal related programs the Great Recession and something like the Affordable Care Act, and now the COVID crisis and, and payments to families that were passed recently and, and perhaps might become permanent um, in the future. Um, and so from your all's perspective, uh, do you see the wake of COVID as a similar opportunity? Um, more generally, what do you see within Criterion 3 as being prioritized going forward, uh, if at all? And yeah, I'll just open the floor to you guys and we can we can continue the conversation. Yeah, happy to happy to keep going. Would you like to start, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have two quick reactions. I think, first of all, yes, there's a real opportunity. I think the opportunity is already being addressed by the Biden administration. Um, I, I sound like a shill for the Biden administration, but 
Um, but I, you know, I, I think they're really making moves. Uh, and I think in general, the pattern you've identified uh, where reforms come in the wake of crisis is, uh, you know, a very profound tendency uh, in history. And I think it's a result of two dynamics. One is that the need is particularly high in the wake of crises, right? People have uh, pressing needs and they, uh, whether the policymakers are genuinely concerned for those people or scared of their votes or their rioting or what have you is, is part of the story. But the other thing is that business influence is very low in the wake of crisis. Um, generally, the opponents to these reforms are business people who don't wanna pay the taxes. Uh, and they say, if you're going to tax us more to pay for these programs, uh, it's going to come from somewhere. It's going to come from our investment. We're not going to invest. Jobs will dry up and you, the policymakers, will get voted out of office or stormed out of office. But in the wake of a crisis, business already isn't investing. Um, and if business is already not investing, their key weapon in the political arena goes away. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's no threat of an investment strike. And I think that's the situation you're seeing right now is uh, business has already been so jammed up that you know, they need the government more than the government needs them. They need the stimulus more than the government needs business. And, and that's a, an exceptional situation in a capitalist economy, in a market economy. Yes, I, I, I would uh, see two points that uh, come about in the wake of crises. Uh, one, uh, simply, uh, I believe it was uh, Rahm Emanuel who uh, insisted that you never let a good crisis go to waste that uh, an economic crisis uh, uh, happens and, or a social crisis. And, and a lot of things that were assumed, uh, a lot of frozen patterns are broken up uh, and there's an opportunity for restructuring. Uh, but from a less uh, perhaps cynical perspective, uh, we look at uh, a, a, what a crisis does is it uh, uh, reveals the shortcomings of our existing arrangements most of the social security measures that we discussed were ensuring against risks of one kind or another for uh, individuals in the society. Uh, and uh, when a crisis comes along, uh, like the depression, um, the risk of joblessness suddenly is revealed not to be an individual failing, or at least not always to be an individual failing, but to uh, be a matter of uh, uh, a social failing that uh, workers were suddenly not able to, no matter how diligent they were, find a job. And the need for unemployment insurance uh, became uh, uh, evident um, and stayed with us in, in between uh, times. Uh, I work a great deal with uh, workers in the hotel and hospitality industry in my work. Um, suddenly at the beginning of this crisis, uh, all the hotels shut their doors and 90% uh, of these workers were laid off. Uh, one of the consequences was loss of income, obviously. Uh, another one though was uh, loss of employer provided health insurance um, within a few months. And this highlighted the need for us to uh, find, it, it, it illustrated the shortcomings of an employer-based uh, or exclusively employer-based uh, health insurance uh, system and uh, in, invites us to go back and take a look at how to provide for these needs uh, since there are situations, uh, risks that uh, the individual worker can't possibly insure against. Absolutely, and I think that um, that's maybe a good segue, segue for sort of pushing on thinking about sort of the priorities or sort of the subcategories of Criterion 3. Um, it seems like, you know, in the wake of COVID is, is definitely an opportunity for us just as everyday people, but also the people that we elect to think about expanding coverage and expanding the way that we provide coverage for, for people. And so um, I guess I don't know if there's a if there's a specific category within there when you think about um, retirement, health insurance, uh, defraying child care costs, uh, things like this, if there's if there's anything that you see as a priority in the in the coming years in particular. Well, I mean, I'll, I, I'll, I guess I'll try to address this as a, a semi-demographer. I mean, I, I think I already alluded to this. I just think there's a lurking demographic crisis. We have an aging population in need of care. Um, we act, you know, we care about these people. They're our friends, they're our family members, they're our colleagues. 
uh, and we do, you know, the labor force is not growing rapidly enough uh, to care uh, directly or indirectly through providing taxes that will support social programs to support the elderly. And, um, you know, one solution is to allow people to have more children. Uh, and as I said, the desired family size is much higher than the uh, achieved family size for uh, the average American. Uh, and the other is to make sure that uh, as workers, you know, as, as young people hit the labor force, they have the skills they need to begin to uh, provide those services or make enough money doing whatever it is that they do that they can pay taxes to provide those services. And so I don't think it's a question of health care or early childhood education. I think these things are complements. You need to provide health care, retirement security, and all these things for the elderly. And you need to provide family allowances and pre-K and things like that so kids get off to a good start. So when they age into the labor force, they're productive enough to pay for the health insurance system, the retirement security, et cetera. And that's where I think you know, the brilliance of the, the Biden program comes in is if you look through all of this legislation, it's all in there. It's not being packaged that way, but it's all in there. So. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Emily, for your responses. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Clayton, too, for the conversation. We have a number of questions in our Q&A, so we'd love to turn to that. Um, to help with Q&A, Stacia Reisinger, um, she'll come on here in a second. She is currently um, a research assistant for the Higgins Labor Program at the Center for Social Concerns. Um, and Stacia, would you like to ask our first question? Yes, hi, everyone. Um, just first of all, I wanted to start out by saying uh, thank you to our panelists for your thoughtful and well-considered um, reflections today. The first question I wanted to address um, comes from the Q&A and it kind of has to do with um, the overall idea of a just wage framework. Um, they ask, can you begin to discuss what a just wage is without including the issue of taxes and prices? Um, and I think this kind of gets at the idea of how do we consider a just wage outside of the framework of um, a specific number, but more so as kind of uh, all of the elements that go into um, providing a decent life? Well, the, the Catholic answer, um, as I alluded to in my remarks, uh, is really rooted in the natural law. Uh, Catholic, uh, the, that response that, uh, a just wage is one that provides uh, a decent life uh, for the worker who's uh, making the contribution and for their family. Um, it doesn't matter, um, as, as I think we've gone over, uh, whether uh, that uh, wage uh, and the Social Security attached um, comes directly in a paycheck or is uh, from uh, generated by society or is offered extended by society, um, it's still rooted in the same work they're performing in the surplus that they're achieving or developing in their, in their job. I mean, yeah, I guess I, um, you know, my mother was a devout Catholic. My father was a devout trade unionist. My mother's answer would have been pretty similar to Clayton's answer. My father's answer would have been as high as you can possibly get uh, is a just wage. Um, I say that jokingly, but I, I, in answer to the specific question about taxes and, um, and the broader array of benefits, that gets back to the point I was trying to make about context. I think it's very hard to have a universal answer to the question of what a just wage is without knowing what taxes are, what benefits are available from the state, what the cost of living is, um, and things like that. Uh, and so I think I, I would want to take all the context and counterfactuals into account um, in deciding. Another question that we have um, is geared towards you specifically, Andrew, but I think, um, Clayton, you'll be able to speak into this as well. Um, in the case of the Brown research assistant, did you experience any pushback from human resources? Um, and what can we do when salaries are set by those who, um, and therefore they're outside of our control? Um, are there any kind of practical suggestions that you have? I think there's a tendency to think that the wage structure is just so big and so vast that there's nothing we can do unless we're actually setting the wages. Do you have any advice? 
I mean, the short answer is no, there was no pushback. I think uh, in general, Brown's pretty flexible about these things. And these days they just are happy to see you hire students who have a need for income. Um, so the, you know, that's a simple one. Uh, when the wages are set elsewhere, uh, my answer is collective organization. Uh, and I, you know, whether that's through trade unions or through uh, you know, alt, alt labor type organizations, uh, creative use of the courts, uh, which the organization I work with in New Mexico has done very proactively and very aggressively. Uh, I think there are a lot of experiments bubbling up, particularly in the context of uh, a very retrograde US labor law uh, to try to allow workers to pursue collective organization to transcend uh, wage setting institutions that are, you know, at best archaic and at worst draconian, uh, and we need more. Uh, I would, I would say, uh, um, much the same. Interestingly enough, I had exactly the same situation at uh, Georgetown, where we're based, when I tried to hire an, an intern, a student intern, and was uh, prompted to provide a wage that was lower than $15 an hour. <laughs> it seemed like uh, um, highly inappropriate for the task uh, that they were being asked to do. So $15 it was. Um, uh, that said, I am, we are not in whatever definition of a just wage we work with, um, we're not required to provide a wage that uh, uh, we're not capable of paying. You can't be obligated to, to uh, do something that uh, um, can't be done. And uh, we do need to pay attention to the signals that we're getting from uh, institutions and things like that uh, about uh, um, uh, what's, what's affordable and what's not. That said, I'm not sure that our traditional collective bargaining system uh, can, is, is capable of addressing uh, the, the kinds of problems we have in our economy today. And we may have to look forward to a future with some kind of sectoral bargaining arrangement or something like that, as some European countries operate in, where uh, an entire segment of the economy, uh, uh, employers and employees negotiate over wages. Uh, because we have, we have a number of segments of our economy especially in the service sector that are just systematically underpaid because of the way our labor market works. Great, yeah, thank you for those answers. Um, uh, moving on to two questions that are uh, related, so I'll go ahead and link them. The first question comes from an anonymous attendee. Uh, it's directed toward Clayton. What is the church's role in advocating for wage policies that protect the dignity of all, the human dignity of all? And um, that's connected to another question uh, from another attendee asking, um, does subsidiarity suggest that state or local governments should tackle social security issues? So if either of you have any thoughts on that, on either of those questions or how those questions kind of um, work in tandem with each other? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, the uh, um, US Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, has been lobbying for some time or, or teaching that uh, it's time to raise our minimum wage because at the current uh, uh, minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, which is about $15,000 a year in a salary, is not a living wage in any state in the United States. Um, uh, subsidiarity teaches us that uh, um, things uh, need to be uh, social functions need to be performed at the level of society uh, that's capable of handling them. Uh, sometimes that means lower and sometimes that means higher. Um, we are uh, uh, currently in a situation where a number of states uh, have taken action to raise their minimum wage as well they should. Um, uh, but the federal minimum wage as, as indicated by that $725 an hour uh, needs to be raised in every state of the union and not to create a situation where uh, some states believe that they achieve an economic advantage by uh, keeping their, their wages as low as possible. Great, we have another question um, from an attendee. And Andrew, this is rooted in your claim of the fissured enforcement mechanism. Um, so what are the prospects for government providing greater enforcement of the law um, 
they mentioned both the IRS and the NLRA and then also the Department of Labor have all been shrinking. So how do we convince Congress to increase government agencies in size and power um, when they've been on the decline? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I think that the problem is that there's an interrelationship between the decline of organized labor and the decline of these agencies since organized labor tends to be the primary voice to expand these agencies. Uh, it is the case that the Biden administration has called for a dramatic expansion uh, in the inspectorates at OSHA and the wage and hour division. Uh, and insofar as a lot of these laws are enforced at the state and local level, there's variation across the states in what's happening. It's not entirely a uh, decline, um, but certainly the real world, it's, it's pessimistic. I, I would like to think that if we are at the dawn of a democratic era where Reaganism is on the scrap heap of history, we'll see some, some uh, return of the regulatory system. But just as Clayton suggests that the traditional collective bargaining system in the US might be outdated for the 21st century economy, and I, I tend to agree with him there, uh, I think the, the uh, traditional uh, regulatory system is outdated for the 21st century economy. The uh, regulatory system that emerged in the United States presupposed that uh, much employment, maybe even most important employment was in very large scale establishments. And you could send a large number of specialists from a host of different agencies in. And you know, if the OSHA person covered safety and health and the wage and hour person covered wages and hours and the EEOC person discrimination, and they went in once a year, there were huge scale economies. You might send one OSHA guy in, but he'd cover 10,000 workers in an auto plant. And so you could afford to staff all of these different agencies and the firms could host all of these different agencies because they had you know, engineers to deal with the safety and health people and they had HR people to deal with wage and hour and they had accountants to deal with the IRS and so on and so forth. In the fissured economy, when you don't have plants of 10,000 people, I mean, an Amazon warehouse with 500 workers is considered a large establishment these days. The inspectors can't achieve scale economies in this way. Uh, and so you would have to not just raise the number of inspectors by you know, a factor of two, you'd have to raise them by a factor of 25 or something in order to cover the, the Fisher workplace. And I think the alternative is to do what some European countries and Latin American countries have done, which is aggregate the responsibilities with the enforcement agents. So instead of having you know, the DOL have five different sub agencies, have a frontline inspector who's in charge of sussing things out in general, safety and health and wages and hours and collective bargaining and discrimination, and then have experts on, on call who could come in if you saw symptoms of abuse in a particular area. Um, and I think you could also use IT for a lot more strategic targeting of high-risk targets. Right now, these agencies don't collaborate. So OSHA finds a violation and when they're in there, they notice that something's going on on the wage front or the collective bargaining front too. They don't even inform wage now or inform NLRB. Um, it's crazy in a world of the IT that we, you know, we use IT to monitor what, you know, what websites you're visiting. We don't use IT to monitor this, you know, the dirt bag in Iowa who's shafting the immigrant workers in the meatpacking plant. Um, so I just think there are, you know, radical measures that need to be taken, not just in terms of funding, but in terms of reorganizing the whole agencies. And then you run into bureaucratic problems and things like that, but they're solvable. Um, you know, Marty Walsh is, you know, he's you know, terrific. Hopefully he'll do it. He could begin to do it. Um, fantastic, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from an attendee uh, who asks, to what extent does the post-pandemic era offer an opportunity to revisit or reframe Criterion 3 as a responsibility to provide health and safety protections for workers in the case of a pandemic, climate, or other systemic crisis? I think that's um, an interesting question that we're probably all considering right now um, as we look to this new normal um, in the hopefully upcoming uh, post-pandemic era. I, I would offer that uh, um, uh, in the, that uh, it does uh, offer an opportunity, um, but only an opportunity, um, which requires a whole lot of resolution. I was thinking of the climate crisis in, in one of the earlier questions about uh, risks that uh, can't be insured against or, or that need to be insured against because individuals aren't capable of, of covering them. Um, but I'll, I, I have to say, uh, um, as a, just as individuals often have a very hard time uh, thinking uh, of the future in terms of making decisions about spending today versus saving for retirement, 
as a society, uh, we have a hard time making these decisions. As a democratic society, it's uh, all too easy for uh, our political leaders to tell us that uh, um, we should uh, continue to uh, enjoy uh, um, uh, high levels of benefits and, and also tax cuts. Uh, we very seldom get uh, um, political leaders who ask us to uh, defer gratification and, and to pay higher taxes in order to prepare for a risk like the climate crisis. And we sorely need that. I, I guess I would piggyback on that. I mean, by my read, Criterion Free already covers those risks. And so far as it talks about health and safety and income, you know, those are the, the risks that are gonna happen to individuals and families as a result of these crises. Uh, whether you wanna frame it differently or sell it differently, I think is, is up to you. Um, but I think what's happening in the real world is we're already moving in that direction, at least a little bit. I mean, you know, I was just teaching an article last week that was written in 1981 that flagged that the United States was the only high income country with no family allowance. And the next day they announced that we had a family. allowance. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I do think there's real progress being made. I think there's more to, to be done, obviously. The last thing I'd say, and this is a little bit more on the previous question. You know, we are perfectly happy to find the tax revenue to enforce uh, other laws, laws against, you know, bank robbery and drug dealing and things like that. Why can't we find the tax revenue to enforce labor law? Uh, you know, these are crimes these employers are committing and they're walking away scot-free. And you would never do this with stick-up artists on the street corner or drug peddlers. Um, and I think part of this is the Democratic Party needs to come out and say, these people are criminals and they need to be treated like criminals. So I think a, a follow-up question just to sort of dig into that political feasibility topic is um, I think sort of throughout the conversation, uh, we've mentioned things about um, like we just need to get people to care about X, Y, and Z when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to the criterion of social security. So when it comes to sort of providing health care as, as maybe a right and not just a, a benefit that you can afford or um, having it having you know enforcement be the only way to have these things done like is the is the key that the democratic party just comes out and, and takes a stand but i don't know if that if that is all that we need to sort of overcome an inertia for people thinking that social security is important especially when it's something like insuring against risk that is so sort of against our myopic tendencies as people to think just in the short term. And, and I don't know what, what you all would think about that. Um, you know, I find the sort of Catholic ideas of dignity of the human person very appealing. For example, I, I went to a Catholic institution for school, but you know, how, how does that get communicated? How does that actually sort of turn into action in getting, in getting these things in place? Well, I mean, I guess what I'll say is I think in a, fundamentally conservative country, at least by OECD standards, uh, and a country whose institutions are, you know, are decidedly not social democratic, um, and whose electoral institutions militate against that sort of uh, coalition building, it's very, very hard. Um, you know, you're not going to conduct an election tomorrow with uh, a far left platform and expect to get 51% of the vote, particularly given the nature of the electoral system where you need more than 51%. Um, but I do think that a step forward would be recognizing in the Democratic Party, and there are voices that do, that there are high road employers out there. There are employers who do treat their workers reasonably well, and there are more who would like to, but can't because their, you know, their um, profits are undercut in a competitive market by the dirt bags. And I think that if you link regulation and aggressive regulation to um, compliance assistance, to help firms that would like to do the right thing, do the right thing and do it profitably, you could make this work. And one thing to remember is most of these dirtbag firms that are really shafting their workers are not the most profitable firms. They're the firms that are actually barely squeaking by. The profitable firms are using new technologies and new managerial techniques and things like that. And so if you could, you know, I mean, Clayton said, you know, don't allow Mississippi to keep a low minimum wage when New York and Massachusetts raise their minimum. Absolutely block the low road, but simultaneously pave the high road and build a coalition in so doing that can link workers with more progressive employers, you know, middle class progressives, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can actually win elections in this crazy electoral system we have. Yeah. 
I think a related question that we've received um, at the risk of becoming too political, um, Andrew, is you've mentioned a few times that the Biden agenda um, and its expansiveness has been really encouraging that there's progress to be made. Um, what are the actual prospects of getting permanent reforms through this Congress? Um, and if not this Congress, do the Democrats have any hope of maintaining their majorities in the 2022 election? Well, I guess you're asking me, I feel like I've talked too much, so I'll try to be quick and let Clayton say something. I mean, you know, a, a week ago, I would have said reasonably high. Mansion seems to be backtracking on the um, on the filibuster thing. Uh, at the same time, West Virginia's got one of the oldest populations in the country. Yeah, you know, uh, I think a lot of the brilliance of the Biden strategy is uh, framing it in terms of family friendly and things like that, that should be able to get, you know, if not bipartisan support, at least mansion type support, um, you know, a lot remains to be seen, but I'm, I'm still guardedly optimistic. And I think that if the Democrats go into the midterm elections, being able to say they've, you know, contained the virus, gotten at least one stimulus bill through, uh, if the economy doesn't collapse between now and then, and avoid the cultural stuff that's divided voters for the past 40 years, uh, I think they have a pretty good chance of doing well in the midterms, uh, despite the uh, obstacles they face, and then moving into the second two years, you know, even in better shape. But you know, am I going to bet on it? I think um, if I could offer a question that, that maybe is a little bit uh, steering away from, from politics, but um, is still policy related in, in terms of sort of policy design, I'd be interested in your all's perspectives in sort of the cash versus in-kind debate when it comes to things with under the social security criterion. So thinking like healthcare benefits, that's something that, you know, if you're just providing the health coverage, that's already in kind, I can't replace that with something else. Um, but in the hypothetical that you provided at the very beginning of your presentation, for example, Andrew, with the, the $10 million, like, perhaps I could provide all of these things for myself. And uh, there's sort of a theory of thought that uh, providing cash might be the best thing to do to respect a person in the terms that they know what's best to in how to spend their money. And um, thinking about those things as well. Um, relating, Clayton, to, to your response, I noticed a quote within uh, the Catholic teaching that talks about a just wage being provided that's enough for a well-behaved wage earner. And thinking about these things in terms of, you know, how do we how do we structure policies that like respect a person that are efficient in in providing them and enforcing them, but that um, you know maybe have to have to rely on trust or have to rely on um, sort of different mechanisms that way? Would just be would just be interested in general in your all's perspectives on on this debate when it comes to these policies. Well, I, I I'd suggest that uh, in in a lot of these cases that. Uh, um, uh, it's not the the cash option uh, is not effective uh, because when you're insuring against risks, uh, especially uh, um, low probability but high consequence events, um, these sorts of things, uh, you can't efficiently cover. That's why we have insurance in the first place in Social Security. Um, my, uh, uh, you can you can suffer an injury that will cost you more than $10 million to take care of uh, on, the, on, the, on the job. Uh, it happens all too frequently in the construction industry that I come out of. Um, it probably varies case by case in the different forms of, of uh, social security that we discussed. Um, some of them might have an efficient delivery system uh, through a cash benefit. But uh, I, I think we've all learned from behavioral economics that uh, uh, people don't always make the best decisions. And uh, uh, in, in, in particular cases and uh, are perfectly capable of the short-term myopic decisions that you talked about. That sometimes it's better to, to plan out uh, a general system of benefits that protects against uh, the most severe risks that we're talking about. Child care might be a different situation. We talked about child care, um, but uh, uh, in terms of workers' comp and, and uh, uh, those kinds of things, uh, cash benefit may be uh, the second best. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think in the case of child care. I mean, you know, I think schooling in third grade and fourth grade we do collectively. I don't see any reason that we don't do it at the preschool level collectively. In Finland and countries where they seem to do a much better job on early childhood preparation. 
uh, do it collectively. They don't do it through cash payouts. So I, I, in general, I, I completely agree. I think doing it through services and um, not through cash payouts makes much more sense. I'm not a libertarian. Um, the other um, thing I would add to this, though, is that government gets better rates when it purchases things collectively than individuals will get. Um, that's you know behind the purchasing co-ops under Obamacare. Um, and it's you know a vast array of social policy throughout the world. It's premised upon collective purchasing that allows government to bid the rates down that individuals just could never do. One last question um, before I ask each of you maybe to give a one minute summary of your remarks and, and just responses. Um, is about the idea of the dignity of work that's often tied to only paid work. Can a dignity of work model support both paid and unpaid work? I think this especially relates um, to what Emily was saying about the pandemic and its effect on mothers um, and just how social security um, is, is typically tied to a paycheck and, and is, is there a way maybe to make that so it's not the case? Absolutely. I, I think there's uh, no question that uh, all work has dignity and it's a, it's a matter of our, our social institutions that we've chosen to make some work unpaid rather than, uh, than paid. Uh, ult ultimately, um, the, uh, another premise within the uh, Catholic social teaching is that the universal destination of goods, uh, the goods that uh, of the earth belong to, ultimately belong to all of us in common because uh, we didn't create them. We received them as a gift. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think not only can the dignity of work be applied to unpaid work, it has to be applied to unpaid work. Um, and I don't think the solution is to pay the unpaid work. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm not a libertarian. I think the solution is to give dignity to unpaid work. Um, and I don't think we have a choice. Great. Um, now I think in the interest of time, we have about eight minutes left. I'll ask each of you for just one minute or less of final responses, final insights on the topic on, on this criterion. Um, Emily, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that there's, um, I don't know, I, I hope that like the, the conversation today encourages encourages sort of water cooler talk about about policy and policy design. I know that, that sounds like a very wonkish thing to say, but um, in terms of, you know, I think that the conversation that we're having and the participants here, we see everything in criterion three as, as a good, right? We see it as something that definitely should be provided. The question is just how. Um, I think that there's a first step with people that we might have other conversations with that need to convince them of that good first um, with, without being in, in the sort of perspectives that, that we all have here, but then also thinking about how all of the alternatives in terms of how that is provided have implications for political feasibility, for the, the outcomes for that person going on. It, it's hard for me to not talk about outcomes as, as somebody that does research for uh, sort of outcomes with social programs and things like this. But um, yeah, the, the elements of design seem, seem incredibly important to me and seem like really the next sort of focus of discussion that um, I look forward to hopefully having more sort of <laughs> conversations with people in my life about. And when it comes to my participation in, in civic life and things like this is that, um, yeah, that, that how question of figuring out uh, the best ways to get people on board, the buy-in, uh, having that all be carried out, it seems like something very incredibly important. And I'm just thankful for, for the presentations today. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe Clayton and then Andrew. Um, I, I really appreciated the conversation here today um, because uh, in a way this was perhaps one of the tougher elements in the just wage framework to try to uh, link. It's not conventionally how we think of a wage, uh, but uh, social security is uh, essential for all the reasons we discussed today uh, that uh, protecting workers, and, and ultimately this derives from the surplus that these workers have created, whether we do it uh, directly in a cash wage or whether we route it through uh, the system of taxation to provide public benefits. Do I, Great, okay. Andrew, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just wanted to say two things. One is, uh, 
I feel like as a sociologist, I haven't spent enough time emphasizing that in an interactive labor market, in an interactive society, uh, what you pay me uh, affects what you, you, know, you get paid or what my brother-in-law get paid, gets paid and so on and so forth. And I think we wanna be very self-conscious about that. We think about any aspects of a just wage. You guys obviously are insofar as you're thinking not just about a wage that's too low, but also a wage that's too high. Um, but I think it, you know, it's, it pays to be acutely conscious of that. The only other thing I'll say is that um, thank you, you guys. I mean, when Dan first asked me to come, um, I, I said, you know, this feels like more like philosophy to me. I'm a social scientist. I don't really do with, deal with normative questions. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to go see Dan and his family since I haven't seen them in a while. Uh, so I accepted the invitation. Now I don't get to go and see Dan and his family. Um, but he said, you know, we just want to start a conversation. And uh, I feel like you've started a conversation with me, at least. I mean, I hadn't thought about these issues nearly as much prior to the invitations I have since. I've thought about them a lot since. My, my views have changed dramatically. Uh, and at my age, it's really nice when your views change dramatically. It makes you feel like maybe you're a little open-minded and you're capable of keeping up with things. And um, so I, I plan to keep thinking about this and I appreciate it. So thanks to everyone. Great, thank you, Andrew. And I would just like to close um, by mentioning what Emily had said earlier. And perhaps my favorite definition of Catholic social teaching and the just wage framework is the effort of getting people to care. That's, um, that's the charge, which can be a challenge, um, but it's conversations like this. And it's also the work that all of you are doing that gets people to care and highlights um, important, important issues of human dignity and, and rights. Um, so thank you all of you for your work and for your contributions today. Um, and thank you too to all of our attendees for joining the session of the Just Wage Forum. As a reminder, we'll hope to see you on April 30th at 10 a.m. for our next session, where we'll focus on criterion four, a just wage structure is non-discriminatory. Again, we'll hear from Charlize Hurst, Mona Lisa, and then a response by Connie Mick. Um, one last announcement too is if you're interested in more labor specific questions, um, the Just Labor Cafe will meet at five o'clock today. You can find a link to join that um, on our website and that will focus mostly on the topic of Amazon and their union vote. So if you're interested in that and you want to have further dialogue, please feel free to tune in then. Um, and thank you all again. Thank you for your contributions and thank you for joining and we'll hope to see you again next time. Thank you so much, Kelly. <laughs> Take care, everyone.